Father God, we love you and we have gathered here today to worship you. We thank you for this day and all that it, all that it means to the believer. Thank you, Lord, for, for the day that you rose again from the grave. We praise you, God, and we, we remember the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus, today. And we come together as a body of believers to celebrate that and to love each other and to gather around the teaching of your word. So, Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes today so that we can learn of you. God, as we open your word, I pray, Father, that you would speak to us. We all need to hear from you. There are so many different needs here today. And God, your word is sufficient, and you are able. You are absolutely able. Nothing can stop you, God, from, from reaching, from speaking, from ministering to the hearts here today. So, Father, I pray that you would speak through me, God. Use me for your glory. Help me, Father, in my weakness, and empower me to preach Christ well. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Today we're looking at Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 as we work our way through the book of Colossians. And I've titled today's message, The Perfect Christian. The Perfect Christian. And I say that kind of in jest, but kind of seriously. Um, subtitle of this message is Markers of Maturity. Markers of Maturity. And I'll explain. Uh, in our text last week that we looked at, especially in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 1, we see what could be described as Paul's motto for ministry, quite frankly. And it was simply this, verse 28, Him we preach, Christ we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So that was Paul's goal. That was his motto. And he, he sought to... Uh, present brothers and sisters in Christ as perfect. Now, obviously, we know there's no such thing, right? No such thing as perfection. And that's not really what the word even means. The sense of the word is whole, complete, or mature. Maturity. Maturity is the goal. Now, let me just say this. You know, there's two different schools of thought on whether it's mature or mature. Okay? And so just, so not to cause any unneeded distraction there. I'm just going to say mature, okay? Yeah. Mature. I've been told it's kind of a, a generational thing. I don't know. But anyways, we're trying to get mature around here, okay? <laughs> and so Christ was the emphasis. Paul said it's him that we preach, and building up the saints to maturity was the goal. That was Paul's goal, and that's our goal. Paul did this by preaching Christ, and by warning people, remember we talked about that last week, warning and teaching, warning and teaching. That was how Paul went about it. Now, as we move into chapter 2 here, Paul immediately goes into the specifics of what maturity looks like. And so that appears to be the, the logical flow of this text. He talks about his goal in ministry, his motto, if you will, his approach. And then you get into chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he kind of fleshes that out. What does it look like? What does the mature Christian look like? And so that's why I've titled this, The, uh, the Perfect Christian, The Mature Christian, Markers of Maturity. That's what we see in our text today. And can I just say that growing, maturing in Christ is such a huge, uh, has such a huge place in the Bible, the whole of the Bible. It really emphasizes maturity, growing. Uh, we see that as God's goal. God's goal for the believer, for the Christian, is to mature, to grow in Christ's likeness. We see that in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, classic verses. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And so that is God's plan, that is God's purpose, is that we would grow in Christ's likeness, that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus, that we would mature, that we would mature into Christ. Now that is not only God's goal for us, but that's the goal for the Christian individually and the church corporately. 
That's what we are trying to do as a church. And it happens individually. Each and every one of us individually are on our own path as we are seeking to grow in the Lord. And we're all in very, very different places and on that path. But even as a church, corporately, as one body, we are growing together into maturity. And uh, Ephesians chapter 4 just lays this out so beautifully. And I, I really feel like in a lot of ways, these few verses here in Ephesians 4 summarizes the whole of the text that we're looking at in Colossians today. And it says this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. There it is, to a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So that we wouldn't be children tossed to and fro by every kind of crazy teaching that may blow through the church, that we would be united in faith, that we would be a perfect man, a perfect woman, complete, whole, mature, and that we would grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ. I had a pastor tell me one time, I was asking him, you know, what exactly are we trying to do? What is the purpose of the church? What is the goal of the church? As a young pastor to an, a more seasoned pastor, what, you know, how would you describe that? He referenced this text, growing up into him who is the head, maturing. And he, uh, he said, Rob, I kind of picture it like this. You know, Christ is the head of the body, and it is a mature head. And the body is immature, and it's, it's like a, a small body that has to catch up with the head. Now, when I told Pastor Dan that, he was like, don't ever say that. He's like, that's really weird and disturbing, and now I can't get that out of my head. So I'm sorry. But, you know, it's such a good way of, of looking at it. You know, Christ is it. He's the head, and he is, he is complete. He is he is totally mature. He, he does not need to grow, but we do. We got some catching up to do. You know, we've been made new in Christ, and now the goal of the Christian life is to grow in him and to look more and more like him all the time, to grow up into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. So that's our goal individually. That is our goal corporately. Now, we all start out as babies in Christ. We all start out as babes. And I think that there's a special grace that God gives us in that season. And I think many of you know what I'm talking about. There's just that, that fire, that excitement. It's just sweet, right? But sooner or later, that kind of dissipates a little bit. And it gets hard. And you, get, you start to wobble a little bit. And in a lot of ways, I think it is like uh, being a baby. You're carried. You're, you're nurtured. Uh, nourished in every way, but as you grow, you got to learn to start walking on your own too. You can't be carried forever. And so God would have us to mature in Him, and it gets difficult. Uh, we have to learn to walk on our own two feet. And I think in a lot of ways you can see the parallel there. But just as with adolescence, we are intended to grow up into maturity. You know, if I, if I were to, instead of this water right here, pull out a baby bottle and started drinking it, that might look strange to some of you. You might think there's a problem here, right? And we understand why. And so the same is true within Christianity. We want to grow up into mature adults in the Lord. The problem is that many insist on remaining as babies, remaining as babes. And the writer of Hebrews actually addresses this. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, he says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Right? And so it's a real, it's a real issue in the church at large. There are people that need to grow up, but they insist they're quite content with being right where they are, staying as a baby. Drinking their bottle, goo goo gaga, that's, that's where it's at. And that cannot be. We don't want to be babies, amen? amen? We want to be mature. Paul describes for us what that looks like in this text. Now let me just say this. None of us have arrived. Amen to that? Amen. 
None of us have arrived, and we're not going to arrive until that day when we're standing with Jesus in glory. And that's just the bottom line. Even Paul admitted that he had not attained, nor had he arrived, at that for which he aimed. I love the verse. I've read it many times. I'll read it again in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm not there, folks. I have not attained. I have not arrived. I have not apprehended, but I continue to move forward. I continue to press on in Jesus' name, and that's where we're at. We haven't arrived, we haven't attained, but we keep moving forward, growing together in Christ until that glorious day that we are with him. Let me also say that I'm not saying you're a weak or an immature Christian if you struggle in any of these areas that uh, we'll be looking at in this text today. Um, you may be, you may struggle in one, two, all of these areas. You know, we're, we're all in this together. We all struggle in one way or the other. Please don't, don't take this as an attack or me saying you're a weak Christian or a baby Christian, but these are markers of maturity to be sure. This is, these are the kinds of things that we ought to be striving for in the Christian life that we ought to be growing towards. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. So much more could be said about what it means to be mature in Christ. But these are some crucial points. And so here they are. There's five. One, being strengthened in the body of Christ or encouraged in community. We talked about that last week. There's a little bit of overlap here, and we'll kind of start there where we left off. The second one is having assurance, having assurance in Christ. Third is unwavering in your faith for Christ. Unwavering, solid, stable, secure. Fourth is having a devotion to Christ, being devoted to Him. And then lastly, satisfied in Christ, being secure, being content, having all sufficiency in Christ. These are five things that I believe Paul lays out as a mark of a mature Christian. This is the kind of thing that Paul was working to instill in his people. All right, you with me? All right, well, let's dig into it. First point, strengthened in the body of Christ or encouraged in the body of Christ. We're going to look at verse 1 and the first part of verse 2 here. In fact, why don't we just read the whole text together? So if you would, stand with me. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. If you don't, Start bringing it. You've got to have your Bible, okay? You know, this is my Bible. It's very special. My wife bought it for me years ago. It's my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Amen? Amen? All right. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have, not, has, excuse me, as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For now this I say, lest... Uh, anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And may God bless his word.
All right, verse 1 and the first part of verse 2, I'll reread that. He says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. So here in verse 1, Paul describes for us this great conflict that he has for these people who have never even seen his face. Now, you'll recall, Paul had not been to Colossae. Now, he was in Ephesus for three years, which was uh, pretty close to Colossae. It was still a little bit of a distance, but Paul had never made that journey there. But there was a guy by the name of Epaphras, who we believe came to Ephesus, was uh, converted to Christianity, discipled by Paul, and he went back to Colossae. And there he planted churches in Colossae. And so now Paul is on house arrest in Rome, very far away. And we believe that Epaphras came to Paul with a report of how the church is doing in Colossae and Laodicea, surrounding areas there. And it's not great. There are some encouraging things to be sure, but there are also some very worrisome things. And so Paul is now writing a letter back to the church of Colossae to these Christians who he has never met. And he's telling them, I have a real conflict for you. And the word conflict in the Greek is agon, agon, and it means to struggle or to agonize. Get the word agonize from that. And so Paul was agonizing for these Christians whom he had never met, whom he had never seen there in Colossae and Laodicea. And I would suggest to you that undoubtedly Paul agonized in prayer. I think in some ways that's exactly what he's saying. I, I, I agonize in prayer for you guys. I, have, I don't know you. I've never met you. But I've heard great things about you, concerning things about you. And I'm agonizing for you, praying for you. I think this speaks of the burden that Paul carried for the church. We talked about that last week. And I think that this speaks of Paul's desire that they get what he is writing to them. He says, I'm agonizing for this, guys, for you, over these things that I'm writing to you, that you'll get it, that you'll actually get it. And so there's an expectation here. These aren't suggestions. These aren't hopes. It isn't if you feel like it or if it, you know, if it sounds good to you. I'm agonizing that when you hear these things, you're going to apply these things, that you're going to live these things out, that these things are going to be true of you by God's grace. And uh, just side note, he mentions Laodicea here. How many of you are familiar with that that uh, that place? Laodicea it rings a bell. It should. Revelation chapter three. It was the which church was it? The lukewarm church. And so I didn't do the exact math, but I think there's about forty to fifty years between the time of this writing. And that statement in Revelation chapter 3. And so, you know, it doesn't look like the church, the trajectory went all that well. Because over the decades, the church declined greatly and became known as the lukewarm church. They weren't hot. They weren't cold. They were just kind of indifferent to the things of God. So let that be a warning to us. Let that be a warning to us. We must take these things so very seriously. We must strive for them, pray for them, live these things out, and encourage one another in them. So what is it here that Paul desired for them? The first thing that we see is that their hearts would be encouraged. Verse 2, His, he agonized over their hearts being encouraged, being knit together. The word for encourage is parakaleo. Now that's, that's actually very close to the word for the Holy Spirit, parakletos, and it means to come alongside, to comfort, to strengthen. Paul wants them to be heartened, if you will, that their hearts would be strengthened, encouraged, comforted, that they would be heartened. William Barclay, um, a great Bible commentary of a bygone era, he said this, speaking of classical Greek, secular Greek, the same word is used, parakaleo, like this. He says, there was a Greek regiment which had lost heart and was utterly dejected. The general sent a leader to talk to it to such purpose that courage was reborn and a body of dispirited men became fit for heroic action. That is what parakaleo means here. It is Paul's prayer that the church may be filled with that courage which can cope with any situation, that they would be heartened, 
Paul's desire, Paul's prayer was that they would be heartened, strengthened, encouraged. Fewer things are more debilitating than discouragement. Would you agree with me? Fewer things are more debilitating than discouragement, disillusionment, being dejected, as it were. Few things are more life-giving to the downcast heart than encouragement. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, discouragement is just, it takes people out of the game altogether. You know, it, it's paralysis, paralyzes people, sidelines them, just takes them out. But to be refreshed, to be revived, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, that is such a gift from God and a gift, frankly, from one another in the body of Christ. And Paul connects this being heartened directly to uh, them being knitted together in love. That's what he says there, that your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. And so this phrase, to be knit together, it's an interesting one. Um, the Greek word, it's sumbibadzo. And the reason I say that is because symbiotic, it it's, uh, comes from that. And, and it's, a, it's a working together or a coming together of, of two different parties or organisms. And the word here, it, it literally is a combination of to be identified with and to board a ship. To board a ship. Right? You get that? This is similar to fellowship. You know what fellowship is? It's two fellas in a ship. <laughs> That is what it is. I mean, you got two guys, and they're rowing, and they are rowing together. It is, they have to be in stride, okay? And they're on the same page. And that's, that's the idea here, to stride together, to bring together, to be of the same mind, on the same page. That is us, in Christ, in love, encouraging one another, because we are of the same mind, the same heart, the same family, the same body. Amen? And Paul said, I want you to be encouraged in that. I want you to be strengthened in that. I want you to be heartened in that. And what is that? Love. In love. Love for Jesus and love for each other. Community. Love. I mean, it's so very important for the church. So very. It's crucial, in fact. 1 John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. The fact that we love each other is a marker that we have passed from death to life. That's amazing, is it not? And so that's how critical love is in the body of Christ. And that was Paul agonized over that, that you guys, your hearts would be knit together in love, that you would be encouraged and strengthened in that. When there's no love in a church, that's a serious problem. But you know, the church has always been filled with encouragers, people that love and encourage one another. We see it. We see it in the Bible. In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, we all know Barnabas, right? You've heard the name Barnabas. Uh, his name was actually Joseph originally. And so in, in chapter 4, verse 36, it says, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas actually means. And so he had a reputation for that. Barnabas was someone who came alongside people. And that's the idea of that word. When Saul first came to Christ, the church was scared to death of him. When he, you know, he became Paul, the, the beloved apostle. But at first, they were terrified because they knew who he was before he came to Christ. He was a persecutor of the church, right? It was Barnabas that came alongside Paul and encouraged the rest of the brothers to accept him and to love him. And so Barnabas truly was a son of encouragement. And that's the kind of thing we got to see happening in the church. That is a mark of maturity, that kind of encouraging happening in our midst. And being encouraged, encouraging others. Another guy in the New Testament that was really marked out like this was Philemon. In the book of Philemon, Paul says to him in verse 4, and, and a few other verses kind of sprinkled together, it says this, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Then he says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Refresh me. 
And so Philemon was a man who was known to be a refresher. He encouraged the saints. He loved the saints. And Paul said, brother, I'm asking you to refresh my heart as well. Because we know the story. Paul was, was asking Philemon to receive this guy back into his home that had left his home, had, had vandalized, stolen property, left. He came to Christ. Paul is sending him back, and he's like, look, I want you to have mercy on this guy. I want you to receive him back. I want you to forgive him. And you're going to be refreshing my heart when you do that. Paul was refreshed when he saw someone else receive mercy, you know? And so being refreshed over, over mercy happening in our midst, being those who extend mercy, being people who are encouraged and also encouraging other people, that is a mark of maturity in the body of Christ. You tracking with me? We, we together on this? This is very important to me. This is very important because, look, I have been so encouraged by the body of Christ over the years. I don't know what I would have done or where I would be without it. And I have been encouraged here countless times by faithful brothers and sisters, and I am encouraged regularly. And I praise God for that because, you know what, there's a lot of discouragement in ministry. There's a lot of discouragement in life generally, like in general, is there not? And so we need encouragers in our lives. And I have been here before and just been absolutely downcast, dejected, hurt, upset. I mean, you name it. And then God just brought someone at that very moment, and they just spoke words of, of life to me that just revived my, my heart and my soul. And I thank God for brothers and sisters in Christ, mature brothers and sisters in Christ, who have the ability to seek to encourage and strengthen one another. And that is a mark of maturity to be sure. We're called to be encouragers in the body of Christ, to be knit together in love. You know, some people can be known for discouragement or, or frustrating or antagonizing. There's not, no room for that in the body of Christ. We can't have that. We can't be that person. You have others who are just neutral. They're not really either way. You know, they're not frustrating or discouraging people, but they're not encouraging either. They're just totally detached. They're neutral. That's not good either. It's a mark of maturity to be a loving and encouraging fixture in the community of Christ, in the body of Christ. And that's something that we want to strive towards. You know, some people insist on isolation, never truly connecting, never really being vulnerable, never really willing to be accountable to the body of Christ or to, to brothers and sisters. You know, that's a discouraging thing to see. It's so encouraging when I see people just come in and find their place. I talked about that last week. You know, it's fascinating to me. Sometimes I see people who aren't even, they haven't really signed on yet. You know, they're, they're close. But they're here and they're seeking. And they're honest about it. And sometimes I feel like they can be more plugged in and committed than, than folks who have been walking with the Lord for years. And they're here, but they're not really here. And there's, I, I just think, what's up with that, you know? And so we want to be connected to the body of Christ. We want to be encouraged in heart, encouraged by one another. And you know, I know about this because this was me for years. This was me for years. And I know it was immaturity on my part. Never really plugging in, never really being part of a family, never always being isolated. And I know that I suffered because of it. I know that I suffered because of it. I know that my growth in Christ, my maturity in Christ was hindered because of it. No doubt in my mind. And not only was I not being encouraged, but I wasn't doing my part. I wasn't encouraging other people. I wasn't doing my part in the body of Christ. And so that's something that we have to fight against. Amen? Amen. We want to be strengthened in the body of Christ, encouraged in the body of Christ through community. Receiving the blessing, being refreshed by others, but absolutely doing our part and refreshing and encouraging others. All right, point two. The next one. One and three, I'm, I spent a little more time on. Two, four, and five, I moved pretty quickly, so don't worry. Assurance in Christ. The, the latter part of verse two there, and into verse three, it says, And attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So now we see that Paul desires for them that they would attain to full assurance of understanding. 
the full assurance of understanding. That is to say that they would be fully confident in what they have come to believe, that they would be fully confident in their understanding of it, that they really grasp it. They really grasp these truths. They understand it. They believe it. They walk in it. And namely, what he hoped that they would be confident in is their understanding of God's mystery, as it says here. God's mystery. And God's mystery, and other translations kind of help bring this out a little more, gives it a little more clarity, is Christ. Is Christ. That which has been revealed. That's what a mystery is in the Bible. Something that was hidden, but in these last days has been revealed. And Christ Jesus is God's great mystery. God's plan of redemption. How God was going to redeem this fallen, wrecked world and bring sinners back to himself to restore them through Christ Jesus. That was God's plan, God's mystery. And that is what Paul wants them to understand fully, is Christ Jesus. That's a mark of maturity, folks, to come to a full understanding of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the center of it all. There's a lot that we could learn in Christianity and should be learning all the time, but the main thing we need to be learning is Christ. We need to be learning Christ and we need to be full of assurance in Christ we need to be assured of him and assured of what we have come to believe and assured of who we are in him we must have that look look you need to know you need to know what you believe and why you believe it you understand you tracking with me you need to know what you believe and what and why you believe it as a pastor you know I, le I learned a lot over the years, and I started teaching, and I would spout different things out. And then one day it, it occurred to me, if someone were to challenge me on that or ask me where I got that from, I don't even know if I could tell them because I'm just repeating stuff that I heard over the years. And I got serious about really digging in and trying to figure out why do I actually believe this stuff? You know, am I, am I sure? What do I believe exactly? You know, that's another thing. There are a lot of different ideas out there about things that we as Christians can can disagree on but you need to you need to take a position on on things uh in the bible and christianity you need to know what you believe and why you believe it and you need to have confidence in what you have purposed in your heart to believe and that was what paul wanted for them he wanted them to be be mature in this not blown to and fro like he said back in ephesians chapter 4 but to be anchored to the truth to have every confidence and assurance of what they have believed, that they would know what they believe and why they believe it. He would have them to fully understand Christ, and this is so important. Who is Jesus? Because there are so many different things out there being put forth about who Jesus is, and there's a lot of craziness out there. And look, the Bible is the source. Jesus is revealed to us through the Word of God, the Scripture, the Old Testament, especially in the New Testament. And so we got to look to the book, folks, to understand Christ. Who is He? From where did He come? We know that He's the second person of the Trinity. He has existed from eternity past, and He was born into this world through a virgin, miraculously, in time and space, and He took on a, a, a second nature. He is truly God, truly human. He lived a life of perfection that none of us could ever live here on this earth. Obedience to the Father's law on every point. We know that he died. He died a sinner's death for the guilty in our stead. That he rose again on the third day from the grave, declaring victory over death, over sin, over Satan. We know that he appeared to many of his believers, over 400 at one point in time, he ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father even now where he ever lives to intercede on our behalf. And he's going to return. He's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. He's going to set up a kingdom here on this earth where he will reign in righteousness for a thousand years. And then comes the eternal state. Then comes the judgment. Then the lake of fire is opened up. And those who are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast there forever in torment. And those who have been redeemed, those who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, will reign with Him in glory, and they will worship Him in splendor for all of eternity. No death, no suffering, no sorrow, no tears, no disease. So you need to know these kinds of things. You need to be assured of these kinds of things. Amen? You must be assured in Christ. You must have assurance in Him. 
And even more importantly, you need to know that you know him. You need to be assured that you know him savingly, not just know some things about him. See, all that stuff I just told you, I could tell you and not know him personally. I could tell you, and there's a lot of people out there that can tell you that kind of stuff, but they haven't really experienced a relationship with Christ. They haven't come to a saving knowledge. They haven't trusted him personally. Those facts haven't become real for the individual, you know. My faith, it has to be in Christ. I must know him personally. It's not my family's faith. It's not my parents' faith. I've told you this before. God doesn't have grandchildren, okay? It has to be your faith. You have to believe these things. You have to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation and trust in him personally. And he must know you because Jesus talks about that. There's going to come a time, there's going to be on that day, people are going to stand before me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all of these things in your name? Didn't we heal the sick and cast out demons and serve you in so many different ways? And he's going to say on that day, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. What? I never knew you. I don't know you. So you were doing all of these things for me. You, you could serve in all of these ways, and you could probably even tell people things about me. But the, the problem is you didn't know me, and I didn't know you. And see, so you've got to have that assurance. You have to be assured that you know Jesus personally, intimately, relationally, savingly. Got to have that assurance. And we can have that assurance. First John tells us that. He says, these things I've written to you who have believed that you may know that you have eternal life. We can know it. We must know it. We must have assurance. And as he says here in verse 3, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, he alone is all we need. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Jesus Christ. And this is kind of what Paul's getting at. Remember, one of the heresies that had crept into this church is that there were many spirit beings that had come forth from God, and Christ was just one of them. He's high up on the, on the, on the chain, but he's one of them to be sure. And that is totally false. And so Paul is saying, no, in him, in him alone, are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and you need no other. And so we must be assured of him and him alone. Amen? You look, Listen, folks, you have to have assurance in Christ. You must, and you can. And if you don't, you need to get it, and you can. I'd love to talk with you after service today. One of the pastors, a brother and sister here, can really encourage you in this. All right, third point. Unwavering in your faith in Christ. You guys with me? You all right? Do we need to do some jumping jacks for a second or, or something like that? This is important, all right? This is important right here. All right, so I've uh, combined verses 4, 5, and 8 from the text because there's kind of some back and forth that happens in, in verses 1 through 10, and 4, 5, and 8 really uh, couple together well here under this point. So unwavering in your faith in Christ. And this is so important, man, because... For myself, for years, and for many Christians, just wavering, back and forth, back and forth, the roller coaster, you know? And so we want to be solid and stable in our faith. And so, uh, verse 4, he says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith, in Christ. Note that there, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So now we see the warning aspect. Remember, back in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 1, he said, Him we preach warning and teaching every man in all wisdom, right? Paul, in his ministry, he absolutely warned people, and we see it right here. And so it just, just naturally flows into this next text that he is sure to warn the people, to caution them. And what is it that he warns them? He warns them to not be deceived with persuasive words. Do not be deceived with persuasive words. Now, I like that. 
that persuasive words. Other translations say, and I'll tell you why, other translations say plausible or well-crafted arguments. Persuasive words, plausible or well-crafted arguments. Folks, you need to understand something. When, when people come to you with false ideologies, false teaching, it's going to be persuasive. It's going to be well-crafted. It's not always going to be some ridiculous goobly gop, okay? I mean, it's going to pull on you. It's going to be very attractive. I mean, we see a lot of stuff out there in Christianity today, and it's like Benny Hinn and the nine persons of the Trinity, or, you know, I mean, just on and on the nonsense goes, and you're like, okay, all right, yeah, whatever. You can see through that, but much of it is not that way. You know, there's a lot of stuff out in the world that pulls on us. There's a lot of stuff that has crept into the church that pulls on us. And we must not be deceived by these things. You understand? We must have the ability to withstand, to be stable, to be unwavering. He says that you be not cheated. That's a, I like that. It's a good word. It means to be robbed of truth and substance. Don't let anybody cheat you, okay? Don't let anybody cheat you of the truth. Okay, don't be robbed of truth and substance. But the word there for cheated, um, it's actually, it means to be taken away or carried away, to be taken captive, like a, a predator and its prey. And that's what it's like. And so Paul says, be very, very careful that you're not deceived, that you're not cheated, that you're not taken off captive, carried away. Like a, like a predator and its prey. We've got to be very careful. And, and what is the bait? What is it that would trap us? What is it that would make us pray for the predator? The NLT, I love how the NLT puts it. It says it's high-sounding nonsense that comes from the thinking of men. High-sounding nonsense. I like that. It sounds really good, but it's also really ridiculous. I'll talk about that in a moment. But it's philosophy. That's the word that, that is in the New King James there. He says, you know, do not be deceived by philosophy. Philosophy. And philosophy simply means the love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. That's what philosophy means, the love of wisdom. Now, MacArthur, he says this, philosophy appears only here in the New Testament, right here in this text, the only place we find it. And the word referred to more than just the merely, uh, merely the academic discipline. So that's what we think of when we think philosophy, right? Academics. He says, but here it describes any theory about God, the world, or the meaning of life. So it's your worldview. Whatever the worldview may be, whether it includes God or not, that's philosophy. And he says, those embracing the Colossian heresy used it to describe the supposed higher knowledge that they claimed to have attained. So there were people in Colossae who claimed that they had all of this hidden knowledge, higher knowledge, secret knowledge, that only, only the superior, only the elites had possession of. And you can have it too. I can give it to you. I mean, there was just a real superior, superiority there, right? And so that's what had crept into the church. It was this philosophical, um, you know, this, this error, philosophical error. And the Greeks there, the Greeks were known for this. That, that had really, that culture there, the Grecian culture had really permeated its way into the church. The church had been really affected by that. They, they were lovers of wisdom. That was what the Greeks boasted in. That was what they sought after. And uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22, Paul says that, For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. He says, But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. So here's the point I'm trying to make. The Greeks really struggled with the idea of Christ and the cross. They struggled with that. And in their, in their kind of thinking... Um, there was this, uh, this ideology that, that anything flesh, any matter, any physical substance was inherently evil. And so God could never take on flesh. God could never be a physical being. So Christ had to be something altogether different. And then you had things like Serentianism, which I believe it was Serentianism, which said that Jesus was like a phantom being. And when he walked, 
there was no footprints on the ground and, and things like that. That was Greek culture. That was Greek philosophy working its way into the church and perverting the gospel. You with me? Okay, so that, that was what was going on there in Colossae. That same thing happens to us today in the church. 2021, philosophy, the philosophies of the world work their way right into the church. It's still happening today, and that is the thing that we have to be on guard against. Okay, we must not be cheated by or deceived by the philosophies of today that would come in and pervert or distort the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel. That's a mark of maturity. Someone who's really strong in their faith. They know what they believe about Christ and why they believe it, and they're confident in it. They're not going to be pulled away by these things. They're not going to waver in their faith. They're going to be steadfast in their faith. You know, so what are, what are some things in our culture, in our day and age, that we have to battle against? Well, a big one is just theological liberalism. Theological liberalism. You know what that is? It's, uh, you know, the Bible is not, not necessarily literal. You know, Adam and Eve, that was, that was myth, mythology. That um, Jesus wasn't actually born of a virgin. You know, the miracles and stuff. The book, the miracles, you know, the, the Bible exists as a story of, of good stories for morality's sake. But you can't really believe that that stuff happened. Theological liberalism is that God is not a judge. God does not have wrath. There is no place as hell. We're all going to heaven. Absolutely everyone is going to make it, no matter who you are or what you've done. Adolf Hitler will be in heaven. Okay, that, that kind of thing. Um, on and on it goes. Uh, Jesus didn't die for sin because that would be, then you would have to, to acknowledge that God is a God of wrath and that God judges sin. And so it wasn't that Jesus was dying in our place. No, no, no substitutionary atonement. No bloody cross religion. No, none of that. And it's just a total unraveling of everything that we know to be the core tenets of the scriptures. It's a total unraveling of the whole thing. What do you have left when it's all said and done? You've got nothing. And that stuff has really taken root in much of the church. And like I said, it's persuasive. Because we struggle with those kinds of things, do we not? Hell, judgment, miracles. I mean, it's easy to be intimidated by people and people think that we're fools for believing such things and to be mocked about it, to want to then somehow change or pervert what we have embraced. You know, there's a, there's a, gos a documentary called American Gospel and part one deals with like the health, wealth, prosperity, miracles, a lot of the stuff, the aberrant stuff going on in the church. You watch that, and it's like, yeah, okay, that, that stuff is ridiculous. You can see that. It's not hard to tell. But there's a second one. There's a part two, and it deals with this, theological liberalism. And as they're interviewing these people that believe this stuff, it pulls on you. It's like it can really stumble you because that stuff is very persuasive. It is well crafted, and it is able to pull you in and to, to, to deceive you because it appeals to human nature. We don't like that stuff. We don't want to believe that stuff, so, so we'll just change it. We'll twist it. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. We live in a time where humanism reigns supreme. Much of the world, they just don't believe there's anything after this, right? And so this is all there is. It's, it's, it's humanity and nothing more. And, and frankly, man is essentially good at the end of the day. We're, we all have greatness within us. And the answer and the solution to, to all the problems of humanity can be found from within us. We can solve all of the earth's problems, all the world's problems. We have that in us. And you know, this sounds really good to people who love themselves and think very highly of themselves. You know, I know there's no good thing in me. There's no good thing in me. I know from where I have come and from where Christ has rescued me. And frankly, folks, look, if the world is depending on me, we're in big trouble. If the world is depending on you, we're in big trouble because the answer and the hope is not within us and it is not within this fallen, depraved humanity. It is only in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. You know, we have to go to Him for truth, for life. It is only found in Him. But, you know, that stuff creeps into the church. 
And now the church is all about being a better you, being a better me, having a better quality of life. And everything, you know, I'm at the center of it all, all and God exists to bless me and to do my bidding. So it's humanism. It has crept into the church. Postmodernism, postmodern thought. Now, I'm just giving you guys oversimplifications here. It's way more complex than my, my mind, you know, than I have the time or the energy to get into. But it's basically this. You can't know absolute truth. In fact, there's no such thing. You know, people would say there's no such thing as absolute truth. And to that I would say, are you absolutely sure about that? <laughs> my perception of reality is my perception, and you can't tell me that it's wrong. And it's amazing. There's a guy, he goes on college campuses, and he evangelizes the youth, and he will put forth some of the craziest scenarios about himself that are, you know, couldn't be, you know, it's obvious that it's not true, but they won't tell him he's wrong. They will not tell him he's wrong because you can't do that. Postmodern thought is if it's your reality, it's right and it's truth. And that kind of stuff creeps into the church. That kind of stuff takes the purity of the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ and our responsibility. And it turns that, see, people love that because they love their sin. You can't tell me that I'm wrong. It feels good. It's right. This is who I am. This is how I am. And there is no standard of absolute truth. So who are you to tell me? You see? And so that, that's the world that we live in. And that creeps into the church. That creeps into the church. You know, the church can get soft. We're not willing to take a hard stance on things. We're not willing to stand for the truth. Evangelicals have become evangelifish. And so that's, you know, we can't do that. We can't do that. There is absolute truth, as has been revealed in the Word of God through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we got to know that, and we got to be solid and secure in that. We don't want to fall for empty deceit. That's hollow deception with no substance. Hollow deception with no substance. You know what it's like? It's like clouds without rain. The Bible uses that kind of language. It, it looks promising, but then there's nothing. Your hopes are up. We're desperate for rain. We need it. The clouds come, the clouds go, they deliver nothing. That's what this is. That's what this is. It's the traditions of men, Paul says. You know, it's just handed down from one person to the next. One person to the next. That doesn't make it true. That doesn't make it right. It's just been handed down from generation to generation. It's the basic principles of this world, Paul says. This kind of stuff, this, this theological aberrance, this, this philosophical nonsense, this high-sounding nonsense that has crept its way into the church, it is the basic principles of the world. Other translations uh, kind of render this spiritual principles, spiritual forces. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a spiritual thing that is happening. First John tells us that there is a spirit in the world that is behind this kind of thing. First John chapter 4, verse 3 says this, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. There is a spirit in the world, and it is Antichrist. And that is what is behind all of this. That is what is behind all of this. And Paul says, beware, be on the lookout. Don't get caught slipping, don't be deceived, don't buy into it, recognize it for what it is. It does not reflect Christ, it blasphemes Christ, right? And so it can look like hostility or uh, intimidation regarding your Christian worldview, People want to mock you, belittle you, intimidate you, threaten you, especially in, in, in uh, you know, the universities. I mean, especially there, but in many other places, it's what it looks like. A pressure for the church to get into social or political arenas. You know, um, the, the spirit of this age, you know, all this social justice stuff that, that is coming on and the way that has crept into the church, and it's changed the gospel. The gospel is not about 
sin and salvation through Christ and, and, and all of that. It's, it's about social reform. Now, it's, it's become about issues of race and, and gender equality and, and things like that. You know, there was a, a, a huge conference, a well-known conference. They were talking a couple years ago, maybe not even that long, that when the next big Bible translation comes out, the people that sit on the committee need to be people from different ethnicities and different cultures. Why is that? What does that have to do with Greek and Hebrew? It's because the Bible will, should better reflect the opinions and the views and the feelings of people from diverse cultures. Why, why is that? What, what, what then happens, you see? And so that, that has worked its way into the church, for the church to get into these, these kinds of things and this division that has sprung up as a result of it, or to get in the political arena. I mean, we see that, that has just exploded Christianity has become synonymous with politics. And so, I mean, that's nothing new. I mean, that happened decades ago. I feel like it's just on a whole nother level now. And people within Christianity are fighting against each other because they don't stand for the same things or whatever, you know, on and on. I've talked about this already, but that it's real. That's the philosophy of the world, and it has made its way into the church. And that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about another king and another kingdom and how to get right with that king, and how to get into that kingdom. You know, Jesus told Pilate, when Pilate was, was questioning Jesus, he said, if my, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, if it were, my soldiers would fight. My people would fight for me. But they didn't, because that's not what Jesus was here for, right? Amen. And so the gospel, the church, it can be pressured into those kinds of things. To embrace worldly you know, philosophies like gender confusion and, and on and on it goes. And just, just to the inconsistency, the incoherency of this, I'll just share with you. There are people who would say that, you know, you can't, you know, if, if you say that you're another gender than what you actually are, then you can't tell somebody that they're not, right? That's not right. You can't do that. If that's, if that's how they feel, then that's what they are. But then at the same time, in recent history, uh, in, in recent news even, there's been, I think, two stories at least that I'm familiar with of, of a, a female who was white who, who pretended she was black and even had uh, positions of, of prestige in the NAACP and things like that. And then it came out that she wasn't actually black and was just absolutely torn apart, torn, torn into pieces. But many of the same people would say that you can change your, your, your gender, that you can identify as something else. Why not your race? And so there's inc incoherency in all of this. And that's why I say it. it sounds good to a lot of people, but it breaks down at some point. It's incoherent. It's inconsistent. It, it, it does not follow through. And so we have to be careful not to get caught up into the high-sounding nonsense that comes from men and to hold fast, steadfast to the pure, true gospel. Amen? Amen. Paul rejoiced, and we're just going to close here. I had two more points, and uh, I'm just going to make a new sermon next week out of those. Amen. Yeah, I'm gonna have, God's have mercy on you today, all right? <laughs> you know, Paul in verse 5, he rejoiced that they had withstood these things and that they were in good order, that you were in good order, not in disarray, not disheveled, uh, not like the sheep being scattered by the wolves. They, they were steadfast. They stayed the course. They stayed true to the gospel, that they were holding fast, and Paul rejoiced in that, that they would be immovable. That's a marker of maturity, the ability to withstand these kinds of pressures, not to succumb to it, not to be seduced by it, not to be intimidated by it, but to hold fast to Christ who is the head, to hold fast to him. That is maturity. In Titus, and I'll close with this, Titus talks uh, P Paul is talking to Titus and he says, I, I'm leaving you there and I, I want you to be able to embrace sound doctrine, hold to the truth that you have received and refute those who contradict it. Refute them head on. I've known guys that want to be in ministry and then they believe every weird and goofy thing that, they, that comes through that they see on YouTube and they send me videos and I'm just like distraught. I'm like, how can you believe this? And you want to be a shepherd? How are you going to protect people when you yourself are just falling to it every time it, it comes along? Folks, we got to, got to withstand that stuff. 
We cannot be children tossed to and fro. We have to be solid in the word of God, solid in doctrine. We have to be steadfast in our faith, not easily swayed, not uprooted, not blown over, not blown away. That's maturity in Christ. Amen? And that's what we need. So, three points that we looked at today. To be strengthened in community. To belong to the body of Christ. To be encouraged and strengthened by your brothers and sisters. And to be a part of that. To reciprocate that. To have full assurance in Christ. To know who He is, what He's done, where He's going. That He's coming back. To know that you are His and that He is yours. And to be steadfast in your faith, despite philosophical pressures. Steadfast, immovable, rock solid in Christ Jesus. Those are markers of maturity. God help us to grow in these areas. Help, help us to, to be that. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the truth of your word. And God, we can't do this without you. We're, we are weak, Lord. And we are needy. But God, by your spirit, not by power, not by might, but by your spirit, O oh Lord, we are able. We are able to be in community and to be surrounded and loved. We are able, O oh Lord, to have full assurance, full assurance in Christ Jesus. And we are able to withstand attack and temptation. We are able to withstand the pressures of this world, the spirit of this world. Be steadfast and movable in you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord, and we trust you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.